everyone. Welcome to Numbers Protocols Industry Interview. Sophia here. So it's a pleasure to be here with an impressive group of guests today. So we have Adam Rose, Benedict Lau, Lindsay Walker from Starling Lab for Data Integrity. So since Numbers started the collaboration with Starling Lab in 2019, I kept hearing about the amazing name in Starling, but never had a chance to meet like many of you. So how about we start with uh, a round of introductions and could each of you just briefly introduce yourself and your role in Starling Lab? So maybe start with Adam. Sure. Well, thank you so much for having us. Uh, we've had a, a real wonderful collaboration with Numbers. I know even before when I joined Starling Lab a little over a year ago, uh, I'm the COO uh, here at Starling Lab, and I come from a background in journalism uh, of about 20 years, working for different major outlets. And as a result, uh, really uh, aligns with the mission here of uh, supporting practitioners across the fields of journalism, law, and history. And uh, I'll hand it uh, off to Ben. Hello, I'm Ben, uh, based in Toronto. Um, <clears throat> I I actually joined Starling Lab um, after the collaboration with Numbers started. Uh, so Numbers has been a really great uh, collaborator with us. Uh, as the CTO of the lab, I, uh, I oversee a lot of the implementations and also the R&D efforts about authentication technologies and registration and decentralized storage that uh, the lab does. Um, so today I look forward to talking more about the specific implementation uh, with the Taiwanese elections. I'll pass it over to Lindsay. Hi, my name is Lindsay. I'm the product lead for Starling Labs for Data Integrity. Uh, I've been with the lab about actually coming up on a year now. Um, so I'm really excited to work with them. I come from a background of education, uh, technical training, and um, most recently I was working uh, for a Web3 company. So that's how I kind of got connected with Starling Lab. Uh, I like a lot of, I love a lot of the things that they do with um, prototyping new, some of these new technologies in um, decentralized, in the world of decentralized applications and um, some of the other Web3 products. And I work a lot with implementation and communicating what we do as a lab. So I'll work with uh, some of our fellows. Usually we, um, we, we get fellows that are from journalism, law, and history. I tend to work a lot with the journalism partners and the history partners. Uh, and we do projects prototyping using these different types of technology. So I work with them on implementation and also communication. So blogs, working on our website, uh, helping others understand what we're doing because a lot of what we do is research and a lot of, and the point is to communicate what we find so that others can build off of that knowledge and and start to build a better system using the different technologies that we use. Thank you. Thank you all for your introduction. So it's really nice to see everyone and thank you for your time today. So I think the first question is, uh, Numbers and Starting Lab are partner in developing the technologies to ensure the data integrity. So could you provide our listeners uh, with an overview of Starting Lab's mission and approach to the data integrity? I think um, maybe Adam can answer the questions. Well, I'm happy to start, but uh, really, I think everyone on the team uh, can provide different sets of perspective, and we all really yeah, work together sure. on this. So uh, mm -hmm. Starling was founded uh, over half a decade ago around the idea of a conceptual framework, which we call the Starling framework. And it looks at the three stages of information's life cycle. Sometimes you know, it's interoperable where these go back and forth. Sometimes it's sequential. Uh, but the main idea here is that we look at the stages of capture, store, and verify. And these uh, aren't necessarily discrete. Again, sometimes they do overlap, but they are all critical in making sure that we can imbue history and society's most important digital records with some form of authenticity, that we can establish roots of trust, that we can do work using cryptography and using decentralized systems to try and ensure that if there is something that maybe matters, let's say it's election coverage and it's records that have been created, photographs from that election, that we can uh, provide some assurance uh, that those images are trustworthy, that we can help uh, show whether it's for a more formal kind of an audit or whether it's for the uh, you know, average reader out there who just wants to know that this is something they can trust, um, you know, we can help them to uh, get there with authenticated metadata and different forms of verification. So fundamentally, that's what the lab uh, looks at across those practice areas that we work on. Um, and you know, from a uh, another concept that we often are talking about is authenticity by design. And so working with numbers, we're trying to make sure that from the very early stages of different systems that are being created, we are making considerations and active choices that reflect the values of uh, authenticity and helping people to understand aspects of integrity and verifiability. So um, ultimately, all of this work gets people to a point where, as I said, trust is what we're really working on. There are always going to be questions, whether it's in an election or other situations, about you know what is true and what is false. And so we don't arbitrate that. Instead, we help people to examine the records and understand those records uh, of what they can trust to make informed decisions for themselves. Mm -hmm. Anything want to add up, like Ben and Lindsay, about the yeah. overview of the starting lab? 
Yeah, I mean, I think actually what I'd like to do is define the word that that is integrity. I found a really good definition of this uh, recently. Yeah. So, and authenticity. So authenticity is being, the, it is the true nature of something, right? So a lot of the work that we do is like Adam said, we're not here to establish the veracity, but we are here to help people uh, assess authenticity. So we provide information that is authenticity information. Uh, so I was reading about, okay, what is the definition of integrity? When you're talking about ethics, integrity is um, staying true, staying authentic uh, with a framework. And our authenticity is our our authenticity and integrity. Um, authenticity for us is having that metadata, um, digital information. Our integrity is, uses the framework of capture, store, verify. So um, when we are defining integrity, we talk about we are staying true to what something is using our framework of capture, store, verify. And we make sure throughout that process that we are capturing, preserving, and making sure it is um, unfakeable, unforgeable, immutable, that di digital information um, continues to have integrity so that people in the realms of journalism, law, and history, where authenticity is high stakes, can establish that. You can see there are a lot of words that are uh, sometimes have uh, meanings that are similar, and it's really difficult for us to as a society come to like the same agreement on on uh what what integrity means what authenticity means when you're looking at a digital media like what 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 is actually verifiable what can i trust um so a big part of starling's job is to establish uh and, and, and innovate and work with people to to uh have a more consistent understanding of of these uh at the time of like misinformation um and the other part is to innovate and build the tools that will allow us to better uh, showcase this thing with better UX and uh, using cryptography, using uh, decentralized systems um, to to make sure that these things in the process of being uh, being adopted is not being like misunderstood by the public. Thank you all for your explanation, and I think it's very important to uh, really have a definition of the integrity and authenticity because people are uh, when we talk to people they are kind of uh, took these two words very serious and starting to have a bunch of questions about it. So uh, unlike my other two co-founders, I my technology is very limited, <laughs> but I feel what Starting Lab is doing is very important. And uh, I think your use case-based approach makes the framework very practical. So companies like uh, we, like Numbers, we can build the commercial solutions based on it and then extend uh, even more use cases. So talking about the use cases, uh, there will be many elections happening in 2024. So we just um, had an election in Taiwan, and it, it takes a lot of attention um, from the global. So with the race of the generative AI, many people are concerned about its impact on the elections and the news media industry. So could you please elaborate on how the technology developed by, uh, in Starling may help on these uh, questions? Maybe starting from Evan? <laughs> Sure. So, you know, there's so many uh, issues that can arise during the course of an election, many of which uh, come through and are distributed to the public and to the electorate through the media. And it's important that the public be able to trust that media that's coming to them to make those decisions when they go to the ballot box. Uh, the problem is that in this day and age, as you've mentioned, you know, there's generative AI, there's deep fakes. And, you know, frankly, there have been issues for decades with photos and, and different types of media content that have been edited, sometimes inappropriately. And what is even the permissible edit is often the question. So across a suite of different tools, tools and technologies, Starling is working to make sure that people can have some way of authenticating and verifying later on uh, whether or not an asset is real. So maybe that's a photograph, maybe that's a video, maybe it's even a, a web recording. You know, and one of the issues that we see mm -hmm. is that people will post things in elections uh, online and it might just disappear. And so we use tools, say, like Web Recorder, which is a great free and open source tool, which allows you to not just take a screenshot of a website, but actually create an authenticated, uh, recorded version of your experience going through it. Not just like a video, but fully replayable, where as you go through and click on each page, it records that page. And it's also, depending on how it's set up, able to pick up uh, information related to the servers that the information is, is coming from. So you can actually show that material comes from a particular uh, service, that you can actually show the date and time that it was recorded. And that way, if the post disappears from a social media site, which may be pertinent, maybe it's something that would relate to, uh, you know, a, a post that someone has made in a in a group related, let's say it's a politician's account, uh, and they say something, you know, that would be potentially disqualifying or that would, you know, the electorate, electorate would want to know, it it's, makes it very hard for them to deny it when this has been captured in a way with authenticity. We think about photographs and video, of course, and, and there's all sorts of things that maybe it involves a politician themselves, but it can also involve the election and the integrity of the voting system. So it could be ballot boxes and how they're moved, how they're accessed, could be access 
to the polls and how long the lines are. It could be things related to protests where uh, you know people are saying or denying that there have been certain activities. Obviously, uh, there's been a lot of concern about that. Uh, you know, overall in terms of misinformation uh, in in the world. You know, in in uh, you know Taiwan, if there's misinformation circulating, the tools that we're using, something like a web recorder, can also be used to capture that and help to analyze it and to be able to show retroactively or even in the moment. Well, this is what is actually being disseminated. Um, going back to the you know, media capture, uh, you know, photos, videos, and, and things like that using technologies, which maybe I'll, I'll hand off to Lindsay or Ben to describe a little more. Um, you know, but the reason that the implications matter is that if people are, say, denied access to a polling station or are dealing with, with some other issue like that, we want to be able to see it. And uh, you know, think about here in the United States, where we had uh, an insurrection at the United States Capitol. There's been a lot of denialism about the severity of that incident. Well, thankfully, it's all very thoroughly documented and recorded. And we want to ensure that when that sort of thing is done, that people can go and have a root of trust in that media that they're reviewing to understand the incidents that happened and are affecting democracies large and small around the globe. So <laughs> this is a really great example of one of these high, high value use cases for this. One of these high, high value, these high value cases where we need to establish the authenticity of something. When you post your, a picture of your food on social media, it's not super important that people know that that is really what you cook for dinner, right? Um, when when our use where when our technology really comes in is in cases where it ha where there, it's high stakes. So an election, um, in a in if you're doing journalistic reporting and maybe you want to be able to verify from multiple sources that aren't a trusted reporter. Um, typically in the past, uh, we've had a physical artifacts to trace back what what makes something up. So if you were looking at the provenance or the history and lineage and the source of a painting, you have physical tools to do that. You can carbon date the paints. You can look at what pigments there are to put it together. With generative AI and, and digital media in general, we don't it, we have less of those footprints. So our methodology takes really great care to insert some of those piece, those artifacts in ways that can't be faked. When we capture something, we use cryptographic primitives, such as hashing the digital media as close to where it is captured. So ideally, that happens right on the camera, right on the video camera where where it's captured. Some, that's not always possible. So sometimes um, when it's uploaded, we we hash that information. And then we can also um, add other pieces of evidence, like you might check a painting to see what pigments there were used in it to have a better understanding of the context that it came from. We can add signatures to our digital media to help people understand, hey, there's more than one uh, source of truth this. Uh, Starling Labs attested to the fact that this hash media was uploaded on this day. Um, and it's also really important, unlike a piece of paint that, that exists in the real world, that we preserve it um, and we preserve that information. So throughout that process, we make sure that we store things um, in a secure cryptographic manner so that evidence is preserved. And, and the very last step of that is making sure it is verifiable. So in these high stakes um, sorts of situations, we want to make sure that the people who are looking to news media for information about their future and what's going on in the world have a way to uh, do that sort of investigation and cross-referencing if needed. I think um, misinformation is not a new thing. We have always had this in both. Uh, in the recent years, we, we got really good at generating it for cheap. Uh, with AI, creating this information is like virtually free. Um, but then there isn't, but, but debunking misinformation is still really expensive. So I think uh, what, we, what we propose is, uh, as Anna mentioned before, um, authenticity by design, being proactive uh, from the beginning in uh, uh, registering authenticity records, having an integrity pipeline uh, from, the, from, from the time of capture and make sure that we can propagate these uh, authenticity information throughout the chain. Um, so the authenticity is one part. Uh, and, and of course, also making these tools accessible to everyone. Uh, we build everything open source. Uh, we, we build things and publish out there, uh, encouraging uh, different organizations, uh, grassroots organizations, commercial collaborators to adopt some of, some of our framework and build something uh, out of it. Um, so the authenticity is one part. The second part is preservation. Um, it's not very useful if you only have the authenticity information. You have all the hashes and signatures, but without the data. Um, but the interesting thing is, once you have the authenticity information decoupled, the preservations, uh, the preservation pipeline can be very uh, creative. You can you can support decentralized preservation patterns, storing things on decentralized networks, decentralized storage networks, uh, managed by very different storage providers. Um, so it really is, um, it gives us new properties like anti-censorship. It gives us uh, also like a lot of censorship is not um, intentional. Link rot, uh, content drift, 
human mistakes, just versioning the wrong thing. This happens all the time, and, and we we don't always get access to the authentic piece of information. When people are discussing about like elections and um, <clears throat> uh, any anything that 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 is that is uh, culturally really important, if you can't attribute it to a specific place, absolutely, you can't really have a meaningful discussion. And and, and I think that's the work that's most valuable to us. And I want to define something, actually, Ben, that you really helped me understand the other day, the difference between regular metadata and integrity metadata. So a photo might come with metadata, where it was taken, a GPS location, who took it, mm -hmm. uh, a comment that somebody uploaded to it. We add another layer on top of that with our process. We add something called integrity metadata. The integrity metadata is data that can tell you about where it came from. Um, do you want to talk a little bit more about what that might be, Ben? No, the, the integrity metadata, right? Yeah. Said, yeah, it, it, it tells us, uh, for example, if you hash something, uh, and you put it in a in a place uh, that that's that everyone references. So a registry, it can be a blockchain, it can be some other some other immutable place. Um, now we know like the the exact uh, file that we that 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 we have on hand because you can't fake a hash. Um, so, the, yeah, hash the, is a one way function. You put it in, you take your ones and zeros, you put it in, you always get the same output, but you can't go backwards to get. Get a code. Yeah. And, and I wouldn't be able to guess what is the pre-image that generated that hash. So it, it means whoever, like uh, registering a hash means the existence of the pre-image. Um, it's sort of a, a really good example, I think, for because I know we're dealing with different audiences here. Some are more technical than others. So for technical audiences, yeah. I know will understand it quite quickly. The <laughs> easy thing, because I'm, I'm a non-technical person by trade myself, uh, is to think of it as a fingerprint, that we digitally extract a fingerprint from a file. And this could be any mm -hmm. length of file. It could be as long as a phone number, or it could be you know hours of video. No matter what you do, it's always going to be usually like a 64 character a number that comes out of that. And I'm simplifying it, but it's like a fingerprint in that you can't go backwards. If you have my fingerprint, you can't reconstruct me. You don't know what's in my head or where I went to school or what food I like. But if you have that fingerprint, you can prove that I was at a certain place at a certain time, or you might be able to register that and prove that I existed. And so that's the idea of this with data, with these files. And so when we make copies of these fingerprints or hashes, as they're really called, and we store them on decentralized systems with these registries that allow us to keep copies in thousands and thousands of places around the world, I'm secure. You can't recreate me from all those servers, but we're able to then go and show what is the authentic version of me if you were to fingerprint me later on. Same thing with the file. That's right. That's right. Thanks for thanks for adding that. And then what Lindsay was saying about um, telling where it came from, uh, we rely on cryptographic signatures on this. Um, so uh, we can a cryptographic signature is uh, is also an unforgeable uh, marker. You and and it it identifies two things. It it knows like what is the content that you're signing. So we put the hash as the thing that's being signed. We know that absolutely. This is the thing that's signed, not something else. It's not another file that I signed. It's not another version of the file that I signed. Um, and you also know the signer. So if a news news organization uh, is associated with a, a signing key, the things that they sign would be attributable to them. So th this allows us to 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 look at look at a piece of media, references, uh, uh, registration records, and then say this thing, this media, this photo, this video came from this uh, this news organization. And also it allows different uh, auditors, uh, notaries, to also do the same thing. They can, they can audit and say, oh, I also looked at this. And I also think, mm -hmm. uh, I also attest that this is truthful. And they can append the signatures to, to, to that same media. It's like signing a contract. It's somebody uh, saying that, you know, if you sign a contract, you're putting your name on it and you're saying me, my identity, maybe hopefully you check my driver's license or my passport first to, to prove I am who I am. And same way, hopefully you're checking somebody's digital signature so you know who, who they are. I attest to the things stated in this contract are what's true and similar things can happen. So places that we might sign something is uh, we can have a device and a, a proven device's mm -hmm. identity sign a picture when it's taken or um, we can have... Um, one thing that we often do is when files are uploaded to our servers, we sign it as well. And our, our identity mm -hmm. or Starling Lab identity is saying, hey, my identity is attesting to the fact that I did this and that I'm I'm the one who signed this contract or I'm the one who did this action. And then like Ben said, it's like a notary at a bank. Somebody later on can go in and check that you are who you say you are and check your signature. And they might put their stamp on that too and say, this is, this is uh, according to what I checked, this is the truth. Mm -hmm. Thank Something you for this 
Yeah, yeah. Sure. Well, something I'd love to do to kind of connect it back to yeah. your original question, because uh, I think there's a lot of really okay. important threads here. And so I, ho I hope that this is yeah. bringing people up to speed on the technology and the concepts. But the question is, why does this matter, especially with elections today in an age of generative well, AI? I'd like to bring it back to something that Ben said a few moments ago, that you know, when you have information that's already out in the world, fact checkers are doing extraordinary work trying to figure out what's true and what's false. And it's a very challenging job, and I really respect that. Very important, obviously, recently in Taiwan's election. It's going to be increasingly important in the election here in the United States, as it has been, and in dozens of countries around the world this year who are having elections. Um, so we focus, instead of going downstream, once information's been released and gone through all sorts of media and platforms, Starling focuses on getting upstream to that information, closer to the point of origin. That's often the best place to imbue this, these sorts of integrity and authenticity markers. And so in a really big picture sense, I'm going to try and uh, share my screen here if I can. I might not be able to. So uh, I will, Sophia, I'll send the link, um, you know, if, if it's possible yeah. to show on screen after this recording. Mm -hmm. um, but there was an article in the Washington Post uh, a few days ago. And um, yeah, unfortunately, I'm not able to, to share my screen, but I'm going to read the headline and the subheadline. The headline is AI is destabilizing the concept of truth itself in 2024 elections. And the subheadline here, former President Donald Trump is among a growing cadre of politicians around the world blaming AI for damning photos, videos, and audio. And I think you know viewers in Taiwan will certainly remember the incident that happened fairly recently with a politician uh, going in and out of a hotel on video, allegedly, and the dispute that came after that about whether or not that was a deep fake or AI generated somehow. Um, you know, in the United States, uh, we face similar sorts of questions, and around the world. This article, I think, does a great job explaining how this is increasingly becoming a problem and a very predictable problem at that. Uh, it's something that researchers sometimes refer to as the liar's dividend, because the more and more people deny things, the dividend that pays off is it gives liars, people who are trying to deny the truth, uh, a chance of at least causing enough confusion, sowing enough doubt that their denialism works. So Starling, instead of going to this downstream side of it, we try and go upstream in that information flow and then to provide uh, the sort of uh, information that whether it's embedded in the file itself or you know comes with these registrations and decentralized systems, whether the storage and the preservation is done decentralized, allows people to have original assets to compare to uh, and to decide for themselves uh, in a world where so much information is unreliable. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. <laughs> So I once heard, um, just echo uh, what Ben mentioned, I once he heard that uh, 10 years later, it is projected that there will only be 1% of the internet content is created by human and all the rest are from AI. <laughs> so I think what's important is to make sure the provenance is traceable. So in the end, what matters is not uh, whether the content is AI generated or not, but how we can establish a reliable way to distinguish it. So I know Starling uh, use open source tools and best practice and case studies to secure the capture, store, and verify digital content and the applications across news media, historical preservation, and legal accountability. So can you please share one use case that makes you feel the most impressive? Yeah, and before we get to that, I kind of want to point something out too. Um, it's something interesting that we saw at the Content Authenticity Initiative Conference, um, and mm -hmm. that is the idea of model collapse, right? Uh, it may or may not come to pass, but um, when AI models train on AI generated data, um, a lot of what what is called hallucinations start to occur. Uh, you yeah. start seeing really, if you look if you look at a photo, you can see this really easily. Um, the photos being generated stop looking like humans. There's really weird uh, malformations going on in the pictures, um, and one way people are trying to prevent this is to put a tag on it that it is okay. This is AI generated data. This is not AI generated mm -hmm. data. I also think this could be valuable where maybe people who are trying to train models want to see uh, photos with authenticity and provenance or a trail yeah. of, of, of where they originated from. So that's an important thing to consider. It's a whole different problem we're addressing, but I think it's mm -hmm. going to come up as well. But um, I'll let Ben and Adam talk since they have more experience with different projects than I do. They've been going back a lot farther. Well, I'll give you an example that I think about. Uh, really, I think this might have been the first Starling project involving uh, the preservation of several pet petabytes of video testimony related to the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. I mentioned before that I come from a news background, um, and I remember distinctly working uh, as an editor uh, with coverage coming in uh, with a world leader uh, at the time, Iran Ahmadinejad, uh, denying the existence of the Holocaust, saying that, well, it's a theory or a hypothesis and you know, suggesting that it didn't really happen. Well, this is one of the most seminal events uh, in what I would call modern history. It has uh, influenced the world in, in in numerable, immeasurable ways ever since then. And people uh, you know, out there may pretend that it doesn't exist. Well, 
how do we overcome that? Uh, and we do it through firsthand witness testimony, that we, we do it through relating this where people are able to say, I was there, I saw it. But the reality is time passes on and there's not as many of these people around today. So with their video testimony, there's an opportunity to preserve uh, you know, these eyewitness accounts for the long haul. But video itself, film or in a digital sense, is relatively new in the scope of history, right? We think about archeologists and historians researching and trying to find cuneiform tablets from thousands of years ago. Well, film doesn't last that long, right? Uh, digital uh, you know, uh, servers uh, don't last that long. Hard drives and flash drives, they just don't last. And the faster and better our technology gets, the shorter it lasts. It's actually an inter interesting dynamic. So the idea of how do we preserve film, not just for you know a couple hundred years, but potentially many, many generations beyond that, thousands of years for history to, you know, to come, well, it's going to take systems. It's not going to be in any one singular place, most likely. And so to me, you know, the most impressive use case is to think about where we are as humanity, what this means for you know our understanding of ourselves as a, as a species, as, as you know, uh, in terms of the ethics, in terms of the, the meanings of our stories, um, which are important. And so we don't just, uh, you know, try and maintain things through oral histories as we have for millennia, um, which is an important and valuable thing as well, but that we're able to provide um, more rich context that uh, prevents denialism and helps people understand human nature itself, uh, you know, thousands of years from now. Those are big sort of audacious uh, thoughts, and it's why I'm here and in large part because of the work that Starling's been doing to try and uh, preserve humanity's most important records in every sense. So to me, um, the idea of looking at that really long-term uh, you know, approach to preservation, you know, we don't know what it's going to look like, but we're doing our best with the technologies we have, and, and that excites me. And for me, so personally, <laughs> so as mentioned previously, there's are there are many like elections in 2024. So I'm uh, looking forward to seeing starting and numbers technologies to be widely adopted. Uh, for example, the Taiwan election project. I think that's the yeah so far <laughs> the most impressive uh, use case for me uh, uh, for working with the starting lab. So the Taiwan election project that we partner together in early January is a good example. Like content and their metadata are captured onto the blockchain and then stored on the decentralized web. And the journalists and the media may have different opinions. However, as a Taiwanese voter, <laughs> knowing there is a reliable content uh, source uh, with neutral and immutable records, that makes me feel safer, like emotionally. I recently did a project um, with uh, Black Voice News, um, mm -hmm. and there a big issue that has been arising in the United States is the fact that um, there's unequal not even, not only healthcare access but a lot of unequal, um, unequitable uh, conditions and environmental factors that are contributing yeah. to racism as a public health crisis. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So we worked with Black Voice News, who did a series on racism as a public health crisis, and they went to different. Um, local, they might be county, state uh, jurisdictions and representatives of the government or of the people or, you know, municipalities. And a lot of them had these um, pledges that, hey, we're going to address this problem of racism as a public health crisis. We're going to put forward XYZ resources and do XYZ mm -hmm. funds. And a lot of these happened on government websites, city websites, municipal websites. Um, it's it's in a system that is owned and very small and uh, not easy to find. So they did this amazing project where they indexed all of these statements, all of the pledges, and even social media um, comments about this, because without uh, accountability for something like this, it really doesn't happen. A lot of times these pledges or um, these claims by politicians or, or governments kind of, they, they go, come in and they come out and nothing gets done with it. So they did this amazing work of scraping all these websites across California. Uh, they even, mm -hmm. uh, they made a data visualization of this. And the big part of this is the working with this um, working on this project made me realize sort of how brittle all of these public yeah. websites were even through throughout this, I would say one or 2% over the few months we were doing that the websites went down, the videos were unretrievable. Mm -hmm. um, so being able to hold people accountable in a provable uh, way is really, really important. Um, I think a lot of what is out there on the web is not as forever as people think. Uh, sometimes yeah. you get a little scared. Of, oh, I, I put this photo on the web. It's on there forever. In the same vein, sometimes it, it's disappearing a lot. And it's really important to be able to capture capture these artifacts um, so mm -hmm. that they can be put together later on, um, you know, later on down the line in ways that we can't even imagine. Part of, yeah, part of that is using systems that are distributed that aren't owned by one person. So in this case, it might be a website that's only being maintained by a municipality with limited resources. The IT person leaves. Um, <laughs> they don't have enough server space or enough money to, to pay for storage. It's going to disappear. Um, so yeah. one thing that we did is, is we made sure that one, we we recorded it in a provable way. So if anyone ever came back and said, to, I don't believe this website's real web. Um, but we also put them in systems that weren't just owned and um, maintained by one person. So we put it in a peer-to-peer -peer data sharing system and we put it in cold archival storage so that down the line, um, maybe this, maybe a, 
a city representative starts to run for office as senator, we want to see how well they're they're meeting um, what they say that they're going to meet. Are they are they doing what they promise to do to their constituents? What is uh, there's a difference between what people say and, and how they act and being able to preserve this in better systems than one one city's maybe server uh, is a lot mm -hmm. better. Yeah, it's very it's also very important. And I think the next question is related to blockchain. So maybe the questions will be preserved for then. <laughs> so I know Starling uses both uh, blockchain and standards like C2PA to ensure the content provenance. So based on your experience and feedback from the actual use cases, what are the pros and cons of these two technologies? And, and um, why have you chosen not to rely solely on one, but uh, about adopt the two? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think of like... Uh integrity information, authenticity information, there are, two, uh, there are three ways to um, bundle them. Uh, one is you have a you have a sidecar file. So you basically mm -hmm. have the original assets and then you have another piece of data. That can be seen. And then you kind of share, share this like among your peers. So if we are in a partnership, uh, maybe two, two, or two news organizations want to share information, they will share the same information with one another alongside the, 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 the digital assets. Another way is to embed the information in the asset itself. Um, mm -hmm. So both of these use cases are supported by, uh, by, by C2PA. You can have a C2PA manifest that, that is uh, as a separate file, you put it into the, in, into the data. The benefit of this is, well, you don't really need another place. You don't need a centralized registry to look up anything. Um, uh, people can form, uh, pe people can uh, just share information without any uh, overhead. They don't have to deal with tokens. Uh, and uh, there's also less risk of uh, leaking private information that, don't, that they don't want to reveal because everything is just kind of between the parties involved. Um, another, another way is to publish it to a central uh, registry, uh, such as publishing to a blockchain. Um, it's great that you don't have to figure out the distribution mechanism. You basically agree on a place to look up things, and that becomes like a uh, like a source of truth. Um, but then, there are many blockchains. The longevity of blockchains uh, and uh, what it would take to compromise a blockchain uh, uh, over time. Uh, we're still in the early days of, of the technology, so some of this is not sure for sure. Um, and also. We usually it's a more complex system because you have to deal with tokens. Because uh, mm -hmm. uh, like what gives it the security is also the fact that it's a massive uh, public infrastructure. It also uh, takes a lot to operate a a uh, a properly decentralized public blockchain. So using that infrastructure, having things run by multiple parties again and again costs a lot of money. Um, so. The downside is, well, if registering every single photo that's taken requires a payment, um, how accessible is this technology? Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe a new, big news organi organization can choose a subset of the photos that's super important to preserve. But can a grassroots organization or a uh, citizen journalist do the same thing? So um, it, it, none of these problems are like insurmountable. They just require different solutions and require different yeah. uh, uh, like understanding and prototyping to figure out what's the right uh, what way to use them. So at Starling, we we recognize all these as like legitimate solutions to a problem. Uh, we, 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 use, we use C2PA usually to uh, uh, publish the final assets. So, so mm -hmm. we, we can put right on the website that we're showing the stuff. Uh, people can download that photo and then verify independently without looking up to any blockchain. But usually mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in, the, in the front end, in the, in the, on the website, we also allow people to to inspect from the public infrastructure, from, from, from the ledger that a record exists, the, the hash, the signature, and part of the metadata that is not sensitive, it, uh, it's also mm -hmm. available on, on the blockchain. We use numbers for this. We, we, we use numbers protocol, uh, and we register it on the numbers blockchain. We register it on the Avalanche blockchain. We use ICN and register on the Litecoin blockchain. Um, and also, we have tried uh, like Ethereum and other technologies. Um, so we, we, we it's, it's, it's very standard that we pick different technologies to prototype. Um, just mm -hmm. the reality is all this technology is in the early phase. And uh, as a lab, we want to try them all. And uh, to take a step back to kind of identify how we use blockchain. So what we do is we take the integrity metadata, right? We take a hash of a photo, we take a signature of a photo, um, and we put it on a blockchain. We don't put all the data. We're not putting the photo on the blockchain. That's a big kind of misconception with a lot of these things. We're putting a record of the fingerprint and the signature that it exists, that it existed. And the reason that this is good is, 
if I uploaded it to Amazon, if I uploaded this, just this list of what existed to Amazon, Amazon has complete control over, um, is it going to go on the ledger? Is it going to go on this immutable database that, that lasts forever? They have complete control over it and it might not last forever. The very nature of blockchains means that to add something to the ledger that is blockchain, um, multiple parties have to come to a consensus about it. And then it, it exists in many places that's not controlled by just one person. Um, so yeah, we, we register the integrity metadata on the blockchain. And like Ben said, we use many different blockchains. This is a nascent technology. We don't know what uh, which, which bubble is going to rise to the top uh, mm -hmm. at the end. But there are properties of it that make it so that it doesn't have, there, there's no one person that has control. And that's not always a bad thing. But in this situation, when we want to preserve something for the long term and preserve something in a neutral way, um, it's it is a really good solution. Yeah, I think that aligns with our with my understanding too. So I think we need both widely adopted standards like C two P A and blockchain technology to ensure the immutability, especially for the news media, and also because I think uh, the use cases are quite different in different uh, areas. So they might have some something um, quite different demands uh, in each of the use case. Very quickly, uh, some yeah. people watching may not be as familiar with C2PA, so I just want to clarify that's mm -hmm. the uh, Coalition for Content Prominence and Authenticity, which is a, a big name, mm -hmm. so that's why it's shortened to C2PA. Uh, yes. And if you go to, uh, I think, contentcredentials.org is the new version of the site that they launched to try and uh, give a full explanation of that, so I encourage people to check that out. It's the standard that is uh, emerging from the industry, a uh, large cross-section mm -hmm. coalition of software makers, hardware manufacturers, and media partners who are trying to adopt a set of standards uh, around authenticity and metadata. Yeah, thanks, Adam. So I think the last question as a numbers co-founder, so I must ask you this question. So what's the future collaboration between starting and numbers do you expect the most? And also, uh, do you have any like a, a long-term goal for starting that? Yeah, I can, I can start. Um, there, there are a few areas. I think uh, user experience is a big one. Uh, I think we, we have the sheer problem of presenting uh, verifi verifiable information to end users, different types of end users. Uh, some might be like accredited auditors, uh, news professionals, others are the general public. Um, so it requires different UX. Um, uh, I, I think numbers have uh, have built multiple multiple UXs, like uh, exploring the lineage of uh, uh, images. Uh, one project we're working on together now is how to present information about uh, videos uh, and different versions of mm -hmm. video contents. Um, uh, and then, Let's see, there's, uh, we have always have collaboration on the capture front, uh, the technology mm -hmm. to get the very first image uh, from the lens to uh, the, the first digital signature. Um, and, and, then, and then before things even hit the blockchain, uh, that, that, that's an area that we have always have uh, active collaboration on. Um, maybe, maybe Lindsay and Adam can add to this as well. Yeah, I've been working with numbers a lot lately, and they we've used them as a tool where they have a, a pipeline where we can take our register, we can take our digital media, usually photos, um, and they register it on several different blockchains for us. Um, and they're coming up with some really great tools that uh, allow you to capture from your cell phone or allow a, a create a dashboard where uh, users or people who are trying to publish in the news media um, can upload uh, their content and display it and display you know license and source mm -hmm. and copyright information. Um, and I think as a lab, our goal is to do research. And then as, as Ben has explained, um, we want to pass this on um, to somebody who, who can own this and build this as a business or a service or as an open source library moving forward. So I think what our main goals are is figure out what works and figure out what doesn't share that with everybody um, with the mm -hmm. hope of it advancing the field as a whole, right? Advancing the whole, the field of being able being able to enable journalists, uh, historians, those working in the legal field, or even everyday users to be able to capture, register, and um, share digital media. And I'll just go sign what Ben said. That I think video is is uh, potentially the most exciting. You know, photography is is something we've done a lot of work on, and uh, it's it's vital, and it's more of a mature space now. Video uh, is more challenging. You have anywhere from 24 to 120 frames per second uh, of photos coming through, and so it's going to and obviously audio aspects as well. So it's going to present some novel challenges, especially on the displaying side of things, uh, but across the entire workflow. So that's something, especially with elections coming up. Uh, you know, uh, with with the election in Taiwan, uh, it was great to collaborate with numbers, and really what kicked off a, a huge year around the globe of elections. And so um, you know, there's I think a lot that we're going to see in the months ahead uh, all, all over the world in this front. Yeah, I'm very excited to see what the future holds. 
So thank you all for sharing your insights and perspective today. So it's been a great conversation and I know a lot of, uh, I understand a lot of the things by your explanation. So to our listeners, be sure to explore the remarkable work being done by Starling Lab and Numbers Protocol in preserving data integrity in various industries. And stay tuned for more engaging discussion on technology, innovation, and future. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you, Sophia. Yeah.